to talk face to face. I know. Well, on Facebook, you think you see everybody all the time, but yeah, I don't think I've seen you for years. <laughs> yeah, so, um, just for you guys and for the whoever is watching on the web, Josh and I met. I think like 2003, so probably about 10 years ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah, about that. I was um on the so, best two years, I think. I was moving Macau. Was it best two years? I yeah. think it was moving McAllister's. No, we we met on the best two years. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And then we did a few films together. Yep. Um. So, so Josh, uh, why don't you tell? Uh, we actually we watched a little bit of Clean Flicks this morning. So talk a, a little bit about kind of uh, where you're at nowadays, what you're doing nowadays. Um. So I'm currently in post production on a documentary that was funded by a nonprofit organization. I spent the last year and a half shooting in Alaska, and then um, I'm starting production on a documentary for a cable news network that I can't talk too much about. But. See, like CNN? Is... Yeah, it's CNN. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so. I did't know, like, if cable news network was like a generic. Well, uh, it's a. Uh, it's, I'm not. I'm not supposed to talk about that one yet, but um, okay. we just barely started it, and then um, yeah, I mean, Cleanflix was the second documentary that I worked on and we had no money. It was shot on mini DV tapes over the course of like three years. It was and the first This Divided State? Or is that what you're talking about? This Divided State was the first um, one that I really worked on. I was um, going to college at uh, UVU, which was UVSC at the time actually. Um, and Michael Moore and Sean Hannity came to campus in the run-up to the 2004 election. Um, There's all this controversy locally about it. And so we just started making a documentary during school, basically, and a bunch of students kind of banded together. And one student kind of got credit as the director, but we all it was pretty evenly split in terms of the production of that project. And then the same thing happened to me at BYU a couple of years later. Dick Cheney was coming to speak, and there was a big controversy over that. And then um, Ralph Nader was invited as like a – as like a protest speaker <laughs> against Dick Cheney. And we ended up covering that uh, story as well. And it was kind of like the follow-up to to the first one, to this yeah. divided state. Um, and, and then kind of after that, you've been working. You worked a little bit in reality television. Yeah, I mean, we started out doing um, – I mean, I was just working on crews with you on a couple of movies. I was doing art department stuff, and I was trying to figure out how to make – you know, become a director, basically. And I realized after wasting several years <laughs> that there was no way to really work your way up to becoming a director. You had to just kind of do it. And so um, that's kind of what Clean Flicks was about, was just taking a step into trying to put my name on something and direct something. And then that opened a lot of other opportunities to do. Even though the film wasn't super successful, we had a big festival premiere, and we were able to play festivals all over the world and stuff. And so... Um, we eventually got a distribution deal, but nothing really in terms of money to speak of. Yeah. Um, but it opened up a bunch of opportunities to basically do nonfiction television and more, a lot more documentaries. So I, I started, I kind of got into development on three or four different documentaries at that time. And then um, we did a reality show. It was like a six part series for national geographic. Um, and then we pitched one to discovery channel, which got picked up, but someone actually, died during that production, so that got canceled. Um, <laughs> so, what was that? What, what project was that? Um, this was like a backyard demolition show. Um, it was the same guys that I did uh, the National Geographic show with. And they, it, you know, the, the channels were always looking for like tough guys in danger shows. And so, yeah. and so, I mean, I am not a huge fan of reality TV, but my idea was if we just take doc, good documentary ideas and translate that to television, you know, and just basically try to do our best to make a good documentary on television. That was the idea behind all of these. So anyway, they were looking for backyard demolition guys, and these guys had, like, in Colorado, had, like, the biggest cache of weapons and, like, ex, you know, military stuff on the planet. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's what that show was going to be. It was called Brothers in Arms, and it was about these two brothers that owned this big uh, cache of of weapons and stuff. It was kind of crazy, but <laughs> an explosion during um, just the filming of the opening credit sequence killed one of the guy's wives. Wow. And so that ended that show immediately, which 
in retrospect, you know, you're like, well, maybe that wasn't the best project to be working on anyway. It was like the best safety working environment. But so I don't know. I mean, you know, going forward from that, it's just been trying to figure out the best way to um, do my own projects that I love and then also try to, you know, actually get paid to do it. So yeah. that's been the, the struggle and the balance. I talk think. a little bit about this Alaska project. Are you able to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, that was just a, that was a project that came to me through a nonprofit organization. Um, and they, I guess in, in Alaska and in the interior of Alaska and particularly in the native communities, is the highest rate of suicide anywhere in the world. Um, and these young men are killing themselves. A lot of it has to do with loss of culture. They've completely lost their, you know, their native culture over the last, you know, 40 years or so. And they call their parents' generation, like our parents' generation, the lost generation, because it was the it was the generation where they basically like left village life behind, went to the city, got educated, and so they lost kind of their religion, they lost their language, and the ramifications of all that is kind of hitting the the youth now. Um, and so there's this big movement from the elders to kind of pass on kind of their traditional living off the land because there's 98% unemployment out in the villages. And, um, and so there's not a lot of opportunity. And so the choices for these kids are either leave home and probably never come back or stay in the village and be in poverty. And so that's what the, they're, you know, what these guys are saying is like, we'll reject capitalism, live off the land. Like all the resources are here. You know, this is what our people have been doing for millions of years or whatever. And so that's kind of the push right now is to get these kids, the youngest generation, to learn all of these old techniques. And so that's what a lot of the stuff we were filming was these guys doing out crazy stuff like bear hunting and wolf hunting and moose hunting and beaver trapping. And so it was, you know, I'm like, like a vegetarian for like, you know, like 15 years. It was a really <laughs> weird experience for me to like go out and like be on these hunting expeditions, but it was super exciting. And I felt like a man for the first time in my life. So that was pretty awesome. The, out on the Yukon river, like we went 120 miles on top of the ice on the Yukon river in like negative 20 degrees. Wow. It was crazy. But yeah, anyway, so, so, uh, you know, so a nonprofit paid for that up front and they had certain requirements that they needed in order to make it kind of work for what they wanted. But I was, I ha basically, they have the rights for Alaska, but I have the rights for the rest of the world. And so that was a perfect combination for me that I got paid a little bit to make that movie. But then I also now own the rights to go and go to film festivals and sell it. And I'm actually going to make different versions of the film. One that's kind of more academic geared toward their needs as a nonprofit. And then one that's just a little more, like of a tone poem or something, kind of like something like Sweetgrass or Leviathan that kind of just is, you know, verite or in the, in the world, even though it's shot like, you know, with a lot of dolly moves and stuff like that. It looks really like kind of slick. It's all set out in this really rugged environment. So, so tackling, tackling a project like that, how do, you, how do you go about kind of scheduling what you're going to shoot or kind of shaping the story beforehand? I mean, that was interesting because that was, it was very episodic and it, the, you know, that was the thing I was trying to figure out the whole time we were shooting is, okay, what is going to be the driving force in the story? Um, and it was hard. I mean, it was something that I, it took me a long time to figure out, about six months to figure out what the kind of driving force of this was going to be. <clears throat> and so for it, basically each, it is episodic and each of these village, we go from village to village to village, but one kind of leads to another. And so I wanted to just kind of have a fluid feel. Um, the, the, the academic version for the nonprofit is going to be a lot more clear because there's actually like this anti-suicide program that's going from village to village talking about it with the, these okay. families. So that really, that really ties it together well, but it's not exactly the kind of movie I want to make. So, you know, we're trying to figure out a way to be a little more artistic with the approach for our version. How long did production take you? It was a year and a half. Um, and it was way different than uh, Clean Flicks. We shot for three years, but we it was in the town we lived in. So um, this was traveling back and forth, and the majority of the cost of the budget was flying to Alaska and back several times. Um, it, our costs were pretty low when we were there because we were living, like, camping basically the whole time. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we spent a ton of money just traveling, and it's really difficult. That's the first thing I, I mean, that's my big takeaway from the project is how hard it is to make a documentary somewhere you're not 
at, <laughs> you know, like to be able to be like, oh, you know, it would be great to have this one establishing shot. Well, it's only like $1,500 to go get it. You know, like it's really difficult to have that distance from your subject and not be able to go just pick up, at least, at least from my previous experience. Um, you know, and I'm approaching everything from the standpoint of not having any money. So we actually had money on this one, but I'm still shooting it almost like, like we don't. That's kind of, you know, because I'm trying to get as much of the money on the screen as I can. And so I mean, we got paid, which was great compared to Clean Flicks. But with this one, it's more like um, every extra cent is tr we're trying to get it, you know, visually up on the screen. So, so my students are kind of, they're, you know, we're, we're beginning students. Yeah. We're doing kind of short documentaries, just mm -hmm. interviews, and we typically kind of start out just doing promotional videos about our college here. Um, so kind of if you would, you know, give someone advice about kind of how to start on a project or weave a story from interviews, what would you, what's kind of your workflow to like kind of starting out and figuring out interview questions, things like that? I mean, it's changing a lot. Um, I think the one thing that's always constant is I just try to think about what I would want to know. Um, I don't, I don't I feel like in some senses it helps to be a little bit of a layman because it allows you to have the perspective of an audience coming in and having the same questions an audience might have. Um, so that's something I, I do a lot of research, but I try not to do too much because I want to be genuinely surprised and I want to really kind of be able to ask those questions on camera. You know, and the, you know, there's just basic stuff of like, try not to talk to the interviewees too much before the interview to make sure mm -hmm. it's not feeling canned or whatever. But, um, but my, my process has changed a lot. I think, you know, just kind of starting out in documentary, I didn't know a lot about it. You know, I mean, I, I just, you know, I was taking interviews and I was basically building the structure out of interviews and then laying B-roll over it, which is a totally effective and reasonable way to do it. But I realized I was allowing the interviewees to kind of tell my story for me and I got hung up in a lot of places where I couldn't get it to move quick enough um, or I couldn't get the exact idea across that I was trying to get across. So my approach has changed now where I try to figure out ways for me to tell the story, whether that's visually or whether that's through, you know, a yeah, piece of text on the screen or voiceover or something like that. I don't like to use those things as much, but I, I try to tell the story and then I use the interviews actually to kind of back up what I'm saying, if that makes sense, yeah. rather than rather than building the you know the thing out of interviews. I try to just use them almost as supporting material for what I'm trying to say, which is a totally different approach, but it's way more effective for storytelling. So, it, you know? so it, kind of taking that approach, do you try to like shape your interview questions to get them to say the things you want them? Like um, I, I, I do both. I mean, I really like to let them just kind of free flow and say occasionally, and, and then I started doing this because I, re I regretted it so many times. It's just getting them to give me a soundbite about something that maybe isn't. That's the other thing is I think people don't understand what a general audience is thinks is interesting about what they do, for instance. Like, and that's that's a reason. That's another reason I don't do too much research because once I, you get like ingrained in it, you have a different perspective on it. So I try do try to like approach a topic usually from what would a general audience you know be able to take away from this. And so I you know I do let them kind of tell their story in their own words, and that's actually really important to me is never to take anyone's words out of context or kind of use them against them, but really let them always tell. Even if I completely disagree with them, I'm always letting them tell their story in their own words. I might refute some of that with other people's interviews or whatever, or, or news footage or whatever. But but um, but in terms of that idea that you were talking about, I think, um, you know, yeah, I might have them say a soundbite if, if I realize that, like me right now, <laughs> they go on and on and on and they don't really say the most important nugget that's important for the listener. So, okay. um, so maybe it's like trying to read phrase something that they're saying or have them say, say it again. Yeah, I, I mean I, I was scared of doing that at first you know and that and I was only after several times of being frustrated in editing that I didn't have the piece I needed that I was like you know what it, it just feels like you're too like being didactic you know, and, or, yeah, yeah and I don't want to inject myself into it too much and I want to I want it to feel honest and that's the thing I hated about reality tv is I felt it didn't feel honest so I didn't want people to be act that's the thing I never want anyone to be acting okay. so if I can get them to say it in a way that's meaningful to them, then I will push them a lot to say say it as you know, like here's what this is what I'll say is here's what I think it is. Can you respond directly to this idea? 
and then I can usually get them to kind of say it in their own words. Okay. Um, it's, it's very rare that I'll give them like a line read and be like, say this, 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 unless they've already said it all and just and it's kind of disparate and I'm trying to get them to kind of co- condense an idea. But um, but I usually, I do want to get like an honest reaction out of them every time. And, and I hate like it, the canned feeling of like having them recite something or trying to act, like getting them to be natural is the biggest key. And that's again, like, the idea of being out on location, spending a lot of time with a subject, and that's not always possible with like a project like on campus or whatever. But um, but trying to spend time with them, at least, are building relationships of trust. Um, you know, where you can, they feel like they can be themselves around you is yeah. the most important thing, I think. Uh, any any tips in terms of shooting, you know, B-roll or visual footage that you kind of how do you approach that in your project? I mean, B-roll is super important. Um, my process changes just depending on what the project is. Um, so if I'm telling a story that's happened in the past, uh, my B-roll suddenly becomes a lot slicker. I'm trying to get the most interesting shots I can get, and you know, I'm doing time lapses or I'm um, thinking of interesting angles or using interesting, uh, you know, lenses and you know, camera moves. If it's very, you know, if it's something that's actually happening, that changes everything, obviously. And so. Um, that is really important to just kind of uh, be aware of the different things that could happen in a day and try to kind of like prepare yourself for that. Do you usually but, yeah. do it with multiple cameras if you're doing like a multiple Yeah, I, I usually like, now that I have some money, uh, you know, and, and then actually when you're in college, you have this opportunity to have other people help you. A lot of the time in the middle there, I didn't have anyone to help me, so I was by myself a lot. Now that I have someone to help, like I usually hire a DP, and have them be the, the main camera, and then I'll shoot second camera. So that way, this is another thing just about collaboration. Like, I know that I'm getting everything exactly the way I want it with my second camera, but I'm allowing the professional the cinematographer to get the best shots they can get and bring their own vision to it and be a good collaborator in that sense that they're really bringing something unique that I wouldn't have thought of yeah. to the project. Any particular cameras you tend to shoot on nowadays? Um, I mean... It just depends on budget, honestly. Like, I, I think cameras aren't as important as we make them. I mean, I think you can shoot. A gr- <laughs> I, I think I think you can shoot a great movie on your phone. I mean, I say I say that having shot clean flicks on SD and it looks terrible, and I'm embarrassed when people watch it. But, um, like you know, I mean, I shoot on Canons a lot. Mostly, the thing I like about the Canons is just the accessibility to lenses, so you can get a lot of really amazing looks for really really low cost. But you know, we're, you know, I'll use a red if I have access to it or if there's budget for it. Um, I would love to shoot on film someday. I just haven't had that opportunity. I've shot a lot of Super 8 stuff that is sitting in my fridge, and I don't know what to do with it. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't even know if Walmart like processes it anymore. So I think I once they stop doing it, that, yeah. I, I didn't bother anymore. So. Yeah, it's hard to get done. There's, I think, there's only one place in the country that still does it. So yeah, yeah. Um, do you guys have any questions for Josh? Yeah. Yeah, Shane. Right. Questions. Um, I'll, I'll probably repeat it too. Yeah. So. yeah. so my question when I was watching the, the movie was, how did, did you have to have any releases signed for the subjects that oh, you were yeah. interviewing? And some of the B-roll, like the people walking in the shirts and things like that, did they know that they're on camera or did they have to sign anything to shoot a documentary? Yeah, so we're talking a little bit about releases, and that's something that we're going to talk about today, and something that is kind of a tricky topic I know in documentary. So talk about a little bit about that. Yeah, documentarians have a lot of leeway with that, um, but if you ever do want your film to be shown in a public forum, then you'd something you definitely have to think a lot about, and that's something I learned the hard way, kind of like shooting my own stuff on the fly, guerrilla style, but then if a television network wants to air it, you're in big trouble, because then you have to go back and either get releases for all those people, all those places, it's really, really difficult. One of the easiest things to do, if it's like a big group crowd, and you guys probably know this, is just hanging, hanging a sign that says we're going to be shooting on this day. Um, if, you, if you're in this area, know that you're, you're probably going to be on camera. And then if there's somebody that we feature directly, we'll get them to sign an interview. But I, you know, we always carry a lot of releases with us in our bags and like trying to get anybody and everybody to kind of sign when we can. But you know, if, if it's a situation like people walking into church or whatever that you know you're not going to be able to get, it's a uh, Try not to shoot, avoid shooting people's faces close up. So shooting a lot of the backs of people's heads, people's feet, you know, using focus tricks to get their faces out of focus. All that stuff's totally fine. If it's somebody that's a public figure, um, 
so someone that's been in the news a lot, like all these clean flicks guys, you actually, a lot of the times, a fair use attorney would argue you don't need permission. Now, fair use is tricky because there's not actually a law on the books. It's just one that has to be tested in court a lot. So there's some awesome guidelines. Um, I think the International Documentary Association released a, a packet from like 20 of the world's top documentary filmmakers. It has a lot of guidelines on the best practices in fair use. And we use that all through production of clean flicks because we didn't have money for a lawyer. So we would kind of reference that a lot. And then we just had our attorney look over it once at the end because um, we didn't have the money to kind of do that through the entire process. But releases, yeah, as much as they're annoying and they take like all the fun out of the creative process, they're really important. You um, tend to, you know, like you did kind of have like the, the issue, you know, the King of Kong issue where you kind of you know, do you get them to sign it like first thing before you do any interviews on the film? Or yeah, it's it depends on who the person is. Um, if it's someone whose trust I'm really trying to gain, I might you know like this documentary I just started. We're filming a lot of guys who are in prison, and their lawyers are really uptight about um, the things that are going to be shown. And so what we I mean we had to make it a, basically an agreement that said um, your lawyer can be present during during the questions. We won't ask anything that your lawyer objects to. We won't use any footage. You know, your lawyer can look over everything before you sign the release. So that puts us in a tough situation in some instances, but then the nice thing about that is even if they're lying to us, we can still have someone else, like a police officer, tell that story from the outside. And so then the juxtaposition of what they're saying and what the official record is still tells that story. But yeah, most of the time I would I would try to get someone to sign even before we start. Like, hey, Nice to meet you. Here's our release form, and try to get them to sign it. Because yeah, you know, you never know. Like King of Khan's a great example. We had the exact same thing actually with Clean Flicks, with our main character. Um, by the time they were done, they did not want to be in the movie anymore, <laughs> and because you know they got themselves into a lot of legal trouble. And so having those releases up front really saved us from a lot of problems. I think that same. I guess recently, Queen of Versailles has kind of been kind of having the same issue. With exactly. The, yeah. And th and those that's stuff that really like the release is just a tool for an attorney if it's tested yeah. because the thing is is like if someone wants to sue you like the queen of Versailles, they're going to sue you and you know it's going to be expensive and you know <laughs> eno insurance is something i would recommend if you have the ability to get it because that's really saved us we've had we have an attorney look over the film write an opinion about that everything we used is fair use and we had all the proper releases etc cetera, etc cetera, and then we used all that lawyer's opinion to go and get insurance so now we are protected. So if there was a lawsuit, it would hit the insurance and would actually be fine. What's, what's E and O stand for? Um, errors and omissions insurance. Okay. Uh -huh. So it really covers you on basically everything. How much does it cost to get that? For um, it, it can be expensive for a feature film. It can be like $10,000, um, which isn't a lot for in the film world, but it's a lot when you're an independent filmmaker. Yeah, exactly. But that's something that like when I budget now, I think about, which again, I didn't do the first time, but now I budget out publicity um, I, I budget out lawyers, I budget out insurance, and those have become almost as important as all the costs you spend making the film. Cool. More questions? Yeah, yeah Chris. Uh, in retrospect to that shoot you did in Alaska with the natives, what was the biggest, you say, your biggest uh, obstacle was to overcome? With the um, or with the shoot in general? Uh, just in general? Um, well, I'll answer this one way. Tell me if this is not what you were talking about. But um, with them, it's that cultural thing where they don't like to talk about themselves. At least, at least within the villages I was in, I can't, you know, I don't want to make that broad generalization. But in the villages we were in, it was kind of t culturally taboo to to talk about yourself because it felt like you were bragging. So that was a really that was a situation where the relationship with the subject really became extremely important um, to getting to tell the story we wanted to tell and it was spending a lot of time with people getting them to trust us and getting them to speak to us as though they were their friends you know like teenagers this happens a lot with is they are really loud and stuff until you turn a camera on and then they immediately are silent and so to get past that point where they felt like we were interviewing them to feeling like they were just still just hanging out with their friends and there happened to be a camera there was 
super, super important. There were obviously, with that shoot, a ton of logistical problems of like almost freezing to death and our cameras not working and the temperatures and frost inside the lens and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, and physical danger, like we were tracked by wolves, like we were circled by a pack of wolves at one point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like there was a grizzly bear that like these hunters I was with chased into the woods and I was just standing in the middle of the woods with only my camera and like nothing to protect myself. It's pretty, there were some crazy things like that. But. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Uh, Did you get on film? I have a lot of stuff with me holding a GoPro saying, hey, if I die, then I just want to say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> 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 but yeah, we got a little bit of it on film. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> cool. Other questions? Yeah, I just have a, going yeah. back to the legality thing, um, the music, how did, how did you get, um, I think, like that first song? So that one we paid for, and luckily it was a punk band from like the 70s, so they... Uh, didn't really care too much about money. And so that was a really actually cheap song to get, but definitely music is an expensive thing. One of, one of our subjects um, fancies himself a piano player, but he's like into eighties pop. And so at one point he busted out, don't stop believing on the piano. And then we had this cool transition that went into the song and that was completely, we had to cut that out of the movie because there was just no way we could ever afford to get that license to that song. How much does a license you know, to a song like that cost if you want to use it for a documentary? It really depends on the company that owns it, and it depends on the, on the artists. Like Led Zeppelin, for instance, are famous for just saying no to people. Um, but like with Don't Stop Believing, I think it was somewhere in the $100,000 range for, to use that song. I mean, the... the um, the exploited song, which starts out the documentary, we got for like two thousand. So it was a pretty good, pretty good nab for a song that was that popular. But like, for instance, with this project I'm working on right now, there's a local artist where I live named Joshua James, who's a big folk guy, and you know his songs have been used on like Sons of Anarchy and big stuff. But because I know him personally, he's just giving it to me for free. So you know it it really ranges a lot. And if I were you, I mean, if it was, if it were me, I tried to not have songs in my mind going in, not, not only because they're so expensive to get, but even for, if you're going to have an original score, this is another thing that happened on clean folks. We had all this score in there that was like um, Radiohead and stuff like that. That was just temp music to, to edit to. But then when our edit, when our composer got in there, he was just like, you know, he would write something awesome, and we would be like, "Well, it doesn't quite sound like Radiohead to me. Make it sound more like that." And so, I mean, there's you know, the music in that movie actually, I'm really unhappy with, and most of the songs I'm unhappy with are ones where he was trying to match our temp music. That's mm. the worst stuff. The stuff where we just let him write is the best stuff in the movie. Mm. So, getting attached to music you can't afford is a bad idea. Yeah. I, uh, I guess the biggest question I have is, is how do you? You said it took three years to make that movie. How, how did you? Like pay the bills, and how, how did what was the end game result of making a film that didn't really make any money? Right. Well, I mean, that was a move for me to have a career, you know, and so to be a director. And so that to me was kind of worth the, the sacrifice. I mean, when I say three years, it's not like we were shooting 12 hours a day, every day for three years, we were following a story that was happening at the time. And so, you know, like, you know, maybe several times a week, we'd say, oh, okay, well, there's this protest happening or, oh, there's something interesting going on, and we'd go film then. It's not like we were filming every day. Now, when I say a year and a half with this Alaska one, it's the same kind of thing. It was over the course of a year and a half, and we'd go up for, like, a one-month trip and be in Alaska for a month, then come home, be home for several months, look at our footage, go back, or be back for a week and a half, you know. So I don't want to give you the wrong impression. And but yeah, were, definitely. We were working on other stuff. On side, yeah. And 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 it was the first time in a long time I had to take like do corporate stuff because I started out kind of doing corporate stuff and I decided I would never do that again. But when I started making a documentary, it was the only way to kind of pay the bills was to go back and do some corporate stuff. How do documentary filmmakers get paid? The best way to get paid is up front, <laughs> is to you know you have to make a couple documentaries before that can happen. Basically, you know, to be able to go to a network and pitch an idea and them know that you can execute that idea. That's just, that's just barely happening for me now where I can go pitch something to ESPN or discovery channel or, you know, HBO and say, this is my idea. Here's a little bit of, you know, five minute reel of what it might look like. And, you know, this is what we want to do. And then they give you money to go shoot it. Um, you know, I had to make three movies before I could get into a position where that worked. And so before that we weren't making a lot of money. I mean, the best way to make money 
if you're not if you're not that size though, is to keep your costs as low as possible and to work your butt off going to film festivals and online, but really online is where all the money's at right now. And the worst thing you can do is sign with a small boutique distributor like we did. Because what I found out after we did that is basically it's about a three thousand dollar cost to get your movies onto Netflix, iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, and and you know we could have done that had we kind of known what the costs involved were. We could have raised the money to do that, but instead we just got this boutique distributor to come in, and they kind of swoop, swooped in and took over all the costs. And now we split everything with them fifty fifty, and that's why we haven't seen any money. Well, not only that, but you know, there's some other issues with them. But <laughs> but also, I mean, it's like we could have done that all ourselves, and then we would have been seeing a lot more of the profits. So it's um, one thing is just make your movie as accessible as possible online. Um, and that curbs a lot of piracy. If people can get your movie for cheap and they can get it easily, then they're gonna pay. They'll pay for it a lot of the time. I mean, we have these guys in Holland recently contacting us, and they're like, you know, we don't get the same Amazon as you guys have. We don't get the same Netflix, and so we don't have access to this movie. And um, you know, we just immediately made it available for streaming and download in the Netherlands, and we made most of our money we've made on the film just just uh, from doing uh, that quick wow. thing. Yeah, that's great. Um, and you guys got clean flicks into some festivals and things like that. So what was that experience like? I mean, we premiered at a huge festival at Toronto, which is one of the biggest in the world. I mean, it's like Sundance, Cannes, Berlin, Toronto, kind of like in that realm. Um, it was the wrong venue for us, though, like looking back on it. I don't know that it's an opportunity we could have turned down because it was such a huge opportunity. Yeah. But it's not like Sundance or South by Southwest where you can walk around with flyers and talk to people and be like, hey, come to my screening. Yeah. It's like Toronto is a... Is a jumping off point for Oscar nominated films basically like the the movies the the studios are trying to launch for the Oscars premiere at Toronto and so we were going up against Michael Moore in the documentary category like and Errol Morris and Werner Herzog like all these guys have movies and for us to be able to get attention at a festival that size like is completely impossible you know um, I mean it was great the good thing again about it is it gave us careers um, and that's kind of the story with clean flicks over and over again whether it's money or festivals or whatever Nothing great came of that exact movie, but it allowed us to do the next thing. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just having been invited to Toronto, we got we didn't have to submit to any other festivals. We got invited to every other festival. We played like thirty festivals over the course of the next year and a half. Um, and you know, a lot of those they pay your way to fly out, and that's an amazing experience. Not only to see the film with an audience who loves movies and loves documentaries. Um, but to have that audience interaction of being able to just stand there and talk about the movie afterward, you know, it's pretty great. And there, there are a lot of shady festivals that I would be aware of as a young filmmaker. A um, festival, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of festivals that don't exist, yeah. you know, that will charge you a $35 uh, fee. And it sounds awesome because it's in Cabo San Lucas. You're like, I want to go to Cabo San Lucas. That sounds awesome. <laughs> and it, there's no festival there. You know, There's one like that in Alaska. It, they, they take submissions, they take money, and there's never, a festival is never held. And those are even on like big festival websites. Like what's the one that everybody uses? Um, I can't think of what it's called right now. But the, the big website where everybody applies to festivals on, the, a lot of those on there are bogus. So uh, <laughs> it's kind of a bummer. And the other bummer about festivals is, that we learned is – they don't really like they say like, like we watch every submission but that's not really true <laughs> like they they first they go to all of the filmmakers who have been at the festival I'm sorry about that they go to all the filmmakers who have been to the festival before and they ask them if they have any films then they go to all of their publicists that they like and they say do you are you working with anybody that has any films and once all of those slots are filled which is like 75% of the festival then they start watching screeners yeah. of submissions, and then they, you know, and then they fill up the remaining few slots with those. So that's really sad and de depressing. But one of the ways around that is just getting a publicist early on, or getting a producer's rep early on, who will get your film seen. And that's what happened with us. We had a producer's rep, who uh, Josh Braun at Submarine Entertainment, who all of the different festival programmers really respect his opinion because he brings a lot of the best films to their festival each year that sell. And so they call him and ask him what he has, you know, coming. So getting your hands on somebody like somebody like that that can help you before you start the f festival submission process is the real key to getting into a major film festival. Cool. Well, um, I think 
we don't want to take too much more of your time. Any yeah. any like documentary films that you love that really inspire you that you would recommend to our students? That depends on what they're into. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I I really like all types of documentaries. I love um, immersive verite stuff. I like you know slick produced stuff. Errol Morris is like my guy probably if I had to pick one major filmmaker. I mean, I like uh, Werner Herzog. Like all the big name, like all the big obvious names. Um, I've been doing this prison film recently, and so the movies I've been looking at are The Arbor, um, Into the Abyss, The Imposter. There's some really awesome stuff going on with documentary right now. I just saw The Imposter. That movie is so it's awesome. Yeah. And so what I love about all those movies, and, and I don't think there's a right way to do a documentary. You know, I was just working with a guy who did Bigger, Stronger, Faster, and mm-hmm. he makes like pop culture, like movies with a lot of jokes and animations and stuff in it, you know, and I think Clean Flicks, I'm so sorry, I tried to turn that off. Clean Flicks has a lot of um, stuff that feels like a pop cult, pop documentary, but we actually, I don't know, we, we miss the tone on that one, basically, because I think it's a lot more serious than people expect from the music and the graphics and everything. Um, but, uh, but you know, I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily make a movie like Michael Moore or Chris Bell, but I can appreciate that. And I don't think there's like, I think people get in like these little weird like yeah. clicks in documentary, and I don't think there's a right way to do it necessarily. I think it's just whatever fits your story best. Um, yeah, like The Imposter is an amazing film, and the, the movement I'm really interested in right now are people who are trying to make documentaries look like fictional films. Like to me, that's the most exciting thing that's happening. Um, because I, I think it's fun to be able to go in and ha- feel like you've had a big cinematic experience um, with a real story, and I think that opens up a general audience more to the idea. You say, like, The Imposter is an example? Like, The Imposter would be, the, like, a great example, though. I feel like Man on Wire, that was pretty... Man on Wire was the first one to kind of bring it back. Like, I think Errol Moore started it, you know, with, like, The Thin Blue Line, and then the idea of reenactments were kind of, like, poo-pooed for, like, 20 years, and I think because of Man on Wire, um, it kind of came back, and I think... I, I love that. I mean, the imposter I keep mentioning, I think is amazing. The Arbor, if you haven't seen it, yeah. is a crazy documentary where the entire thing is built on these audio interviews, but you never see the talking heads. You have actors, the entire movie playing out scenes from the movie, but lip syncing to the actual audio interviews. Wow. It's like the weirdest experience ever. Uh-huh. You just watch the trailer or like the first five, watch like the first five minutes on Netflix and you'll be blown away by the process. But I, I'm, I love film experimentation, and so like anybody that's kind of like trying to push it in a new direction, I find interesting. Cool. Well, Josh, thank you so much for visiting with Thanks, us. We, we appreciate it. Hey, Thanks. And uh, do you have a question? Yeah, just one of my yeah, yeah. Um, As far as uh, submitting to like Discovery and ESPN and things like that, do you use like a production rep for that as well? Or also- um. Some good places to submit videos online. Uh, for what purpose submitting online? Just to get your stuff out there to be seen. I mean, there are a lot. There are a lot of contests and stuff, and I had. N- I just recently did my first contest. I always thought of that as like something I didn't want to really be involved with. Was but that Dorita Super Bowl contest. I did not do the Dorita Super Bowl <laughs> contest. Um, no, I did. A, I submitted to a reality show actually. Um, that follows documentary filmmakers, so it's like Project Greenlight for documentary filmmakers, basically. And that was the first thing I've ever submitted because if you win, they give you the budget to make a film. So I was like, I'm going to go for this. Mm-hmm. But, um, uh, but you know, I mean, I would say contests. I know that's kind of lame. You know, I mean, honestly, YouTube and Vimeo. If people see your stuff, it's going to get attention if it's good. You know, um, in terms of submitting to the to the networks. Like Discovery has a por- like a, they call it the producers portal. You can find it online and you can submit any idea to them. You have to be careful, um, you know, to because they'll steal it. <laughs> <laughs> the most important thing is to have a story that only can be told through the people you're following, and then have those people under contract locked down, because then they like okay, we want you know I've got the guy who's you know the world record holder and eating Doritos or whatever. Like if you have him under contract then they're not going to go to the number two guy. They want the number one guy. And so that's the, that's going to be the reason they work with you. I wouldn't recommend reality TV. It's like the shadiest business of all the <laughs> entertainment industries. Um, you know, like people think music and movies are bad, but like reality TV is insanely bad. Did you, I don't know if we talked about this, but you listened to that business episode about the, 
that reality crew getting stranded down in South America. I did, yeah, that was funny. Pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah and that's um, that stuff happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they they don't have very big budgets. Like you'd you'd be surprised for how many people watch them and how big the networks are. They keep the budgets super super low, which makes sense like economically, but yeah, it's really rough stuff. Um. I'm an independent guy. Like I, that's what I prefer. If I can get, if I can get a grant, I mean, they're great grant organizations. If you have a topic, you feel like it's an important topic. There are several amazing, like center reach um, grant organizations you can write to. And they're going to, again, they're going to want to see like a two minute, five minute teaser of what your idea is or what it might look like. Um, and they're really great about giving stuff to, to novices. You don't have to be an experienced filmmaker. But I, I'm a proponent of just doing the story you want to do and, you know, submitting it to a, a producer's rep or an agent or somebody and then getting it to a festival. And I mean, that only probably because that's what worked for me, but that's what gave me a career, you know, so that's the thing I can recommend pretty easily. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Josh. Thank you. Yeah. Really appreciate thanks, it. And, uh, I'll be in touch.